morning. So, okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll get going this morning. Uh, welcome to the uh, University of Toronto Department of Surgery rounds. This is one of my favorite rounds of the year because essentially we're highlighting the accomplishments of two of our very talented uh, faculty members. Uh, we'll be hearing first from the uh, Peters Prize uh, Award winner. And just a reminder, Peters Prize is an award given to a uh, junior faculty member, mm -hmm. typically within the first five years of, uh, of starting faculty appointment. And this year's award winner is uh, Dr. Jefferson Wilson, whom I'll introduce in just a moment. And then the Lister Prize is given to a more senior faculty member, typically after more than uh, 10 years of accomplishments have been registered. And uh, the talent pool, as you can imagine, in the Department of Surgery is um, considerable, it's uh, sizable. And so the awards committee in the Department of Surgery has its hands full deliberating every year as to who will win each one of these uh, major prizes in the Department of Surgery. You'll recall that we hand out these awards usually at uh, Gala Day, um, Gala event celebration, as we're in the middle of the pandemic. We canceled the Gala celebration this year, but I wish to assure you that our award winners this year have received their award, plus their monetary uh, contribution to the award. So they are all set, and I think they're all ready to uh, give their presentations uh, today. So the George Armstrong Peters Prize uh, listed here are the previous awardees that you can see, but George Armstrong Peters was general surgeon, worked at SickKids and the Toronto General Hospital at the turn of the last century. Uh, he was apparently very skillful um, and a general surgeon. And uh, you can see that this award has been given out since 1912, uh, but continuously since 1986. And if you look at the list of uh, some of the previous awardees like Doctors Galley, uh, Banting, uh, we're in the 100th year anniversary, as you know, of the celebration of insulin. Uh, Kurgan, uh, Keith, Botterill, Tovey, Salter, Lahid, um, and so on, Strasbourg. Uh, the list goes on and on and um, continuously since 1986. And so a uh, very uh, distinguished award in our department. Um, and Jefferson Wilson, to introduce him, a graduate uh, medical school from University of Saskatchewan, residency at the University of Toronto, did his PhD in the uh, Graduate School of IMS uh, in the Surgeon Scientist Training Program, a fellowship in spine in the United States at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, staff neurosurgeon at St. Mike's in 2016. He's received uh, Young Clinician Investigator Award, Early Research Awards, uh, Ontario Ministry of Health, grants uh, through numerous uh, peer-reviewed agencies that are listed uh, here on the slide, H index at his uh, young and tender age of 32, over 100 uh, peer reviewed publications, 20 book chapters. He's a clinical trials lead investigator and deputy editor of one of the spine uh, journals. And I have a photograph here of uh, Jeff and his family outside, I, I think is their home in Toronto. So it was um, really wonderful that we could recruit uh, Jeff to the University of Toronto as he had many uh, career choices uh, as uh, jobs were being offered to him. So. Jeff, uh, over to you. We'll have you um, share your screen and um, start your presentation for the George Armstrong Peters Prize. Jeff Wilson, ladies and gentlemen. Can you see me okay there, Dr. Rucka? Yeah, we're in good shape. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, th thanks, for, thanks very much for that kind uh, uh, introduction and uh, really, um, it's, it's really an honor. Um, to, to receive this prize. And when you look back at the previous recipients, I, I really feel wholly undeserving uh, of this award, but nonetheless, very thankful and very honored. Um, it, continue, it continues to be a significant privilege for me to work um, in the Department of Surgery at University of Toronto, and specifically here at St. Mike's in the Division of Neurosurgery. Um, as you alluded to, I'm a, a neurosurgeon scientist uh, and interested in clinical epidemiology. Uh, been slowly building a program, a research program looking at traumatic and non-traumatic um, spinal cord injury. And the goal today is to talk a little bit about one aspect of that program, which is our um, interest in adapting elements of personalized uh, medicine um, to the investigation of these conditions. And we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, speaking about, about uh, this effort uh, this morning. I think uh, just stepping back for a minute, um, it's clear that really we are uh, beyond the era of the generic and we live currently in a world that is really personalized 
uh, to each of us. And that's large, largely a reflection of the fact that um, for the last 10 to 20 years, the companies and institutions which we rely on and interact with the most have been collecting systematic data on all of us, on our practices, our personal behaviors, uh, our interests, and they've been using this data in combination with uh, more modern analytic techniques such as AI and uh, machine learning to uh, deliver us uh, personalized uh, offers, uh, strategies, opportunities in all these domains. So no longer are there generic one size fits all approach for approaches offered by these companies, but rather these companies are interested in uh, understanding and offering us what we want and need, uh, not only now, but in the future. And this was brought home to me uh, last weekend when I sat down for a little R&R &R on the couch and uh, opened Netflix. And I was, uh, I was met with this opening screen with a number of titles that interestingly didn't really entice retreat, Dirty John, Yummy Mummies really aren't really my cup of tea. And I thought to myself, uh, Netflix is really, uh, to a certain extent, dropping the ball on this whole concept of uh, personalized entertainment recommendations. But then I clued in and realized I was logged into my wife's account and quickly I reverted to my own accounts and all was right in the world. These topics and, and uh, uh, titles appeal to me more. This is really an example of uh, personalization. And this is uh, Netflix a patented a proprietary machine learning algorithm that helps to predict what we want to watch based on our previous viewing practices and keeps us coming back from more entertained and engaged. And of course, there are some controversies around this sort of uh, approach. Um, certainly topics around uh, data privacy, things like that are, are apropos, but it's hard to argue with the results. Data shows that this results in improved user experience, increased happiness, improved efficiencies. And on the company side, it leads to reduced costs and uh, increased revenues. So uh, multiple stakeholders are benefiting from this. From the in the medical world, we want to import this sort of uh, practice. And we've been doing so in the way of a personalized or precision uh, medicine approach, which has been introduced over the last 10 to 20 years and is uh, really gaining steam. Of course, to review, this is a medical model that separates people into different groups with medical decisions, practices, and interventions uh, really being tailored to the individual patients based on their predicted response or risk of disease and the goals similar to, similarly to what we saw with companies and organizations uh, we can apply to patients and that is to improve outcomes, improve efficiencies, reduce complications and costs. And I know you're all familiar with this, but I think it bears repeating that the previous approach was that uh, a group of patients, say, for instance, with colon cancer would, would get one generic therapy. Some may benefit, some may not benefit, and others might actually experience decline due to adverse events. But the new personalized approach is that patients are really partitioned into more homogeneous subgroups, and they're given uh, individualized therapies based on their predicted response to result in a more uniform benefit. And there have been a number of examples of where this has, is uh, being championed and is succeeding in surgery. Some, some close to home include the, that of the work of Dr. Taylors and Rutka and others at SickKids looking at pedi pediatric brain tumors, uh, specifically medulloblastoma and looking at the genomic profile of these tumors in the clinical course of patients they've been able to develop risk strata, which uh, can lead to, to tailoring of treatment and a more personalized approach to care of these, uh, of these children. On the orthopedic side, with the developments of uh, 3D printing and custom implant uh, development, uh, you can now get companies to develop uh, preoperatively uh, patient-specific anatomical models for preoperative practicing or educational purposes. We can also develop uh, personalized implants uh, or personalized guides based on the individual's anatomy um, and the specifics of the pathology at play. Of course, there are barriers to development of personal or bar barriers to the use of uh, personalized medicine and surgery. Of course, this is a data hungry process which requires a large investment, a lot of time. And for those of us in busy surgical practices, it can be difficult to implement some parts of this. Of course, there are certain pathologies um, which are very time sensitive, which require pressing treatment, which may not be uh, amenable to the use of a personalized medicine approach. I think one of the other main barriers is the last point is that traditionally in surgery, we're very reliant on our own anecdotal experience, our own heuristics 
to determine what we're going to do with the patient sitting in front of us. And I think that's a well uh, tried and true approach, but I think there's increased recognition that we also need to rely on data to help inform us about what to do with patients, how to treat patients and, and what comes next uh, for patient care. Um, our goal over the last little while is to, to, to adapt uh, these principles uh, to help improve the assessment care and outcomes of patients with spinal cord injury. And when I think most of us think about traumatic or, uh, spinal cord injury, we think about a traumatic spinal cord injury, such as this unfortunate person um, we treated at St. Mike's this summer who dove into a shallow end of the pool and had a quite devastating fracture dislocation of his neck and a complete cervical spinal cord injury. It's very unfortunate a young person struck down um, at the early phases of their life. And there are certain key examples of this uh, in popular culture and media, which uh, keep this uh, basically close to our hearts and, and make it an important research and clinical prerogative. But in fact, the more common cause of spinal cord injury uh, and perhaps one that is more under discussed and under recognized is non traumatic spinal cord injury, specifically um, the degenerative cervical myelopathy. This is when uh, progressive age related um, arthritic changes lead to compression of the spinal cord and a syndrome typified by uh, problems with hand dexterity and balance issues. And we think that this is one of the most common causes of spinal cord dysfunction in the world. This was a recent analysis which our group did which looked at the most common indications for surgery on the central nervous system uh, in the US. And one would think that perhaps brain tumor removal, evacuation of uh, subdural clots or brain injury or even treatment of intracranial aneurysms would predominate. But in fact, cervical myelopathy is the most common indication for surgery on the central nervous system um, and about four times more so than say traumatic spinal cord injury. So it's certainly prevalent and common and worthy of our attentions. There's a significant spectrum of disease. Patients range on this spectrum from very severe, uh, basically wheelchair or bedridden, unable to use their hands, the more mild side of the spectrum, which is patients that are very functional, good quality of life, and come in with very minor complaints like hand numbness uh, or neck pain. Of course, there's a significant uh, you know, heterogeneity in terms of the pathology we encounter. Not all patients are created equally. So there are patients that have multi-level disease. There are patients that have uh, predominantly anterior pathology, posterior pathology, circumferential pathology. Of course, there are difficulties with cervical alignment too. Patients may have cervical scoliosis or problems with their sag sagittal balance. And that uh, basically indicates uh, to most that this requires a, uh, a bit of a personalized approach for treatment. But unfortunately, the old paradigm was not that of personalized care. It was really a one-size-fits-all approach. And that is Patients that had symptoms and an MRI showing spinal cord compression would really get surgery. And typically that would involve a cervical fusion. Um, and there's increasing thought that this is overly simplistic um, and worthy of revision. And then it really doesn't recognize the heterogeneity which, which exists within these, this patient group. So what we've been moving to and what we've been doing at St. Mike's over the last few years is adopting a personalized approach. So patients that come in with cervical myelopathy um, have a host of assessments performed, um, gait assessments, sophisticated hand function tests, um, multi-structural, multimodal MRI, as well as collection of uh, serum samples for biomarker assessment, as well as um, a variety of uh, uh, a, uh, uh, patient reported outcomes. And we're using this to build a large data repository, which will uh, apply variety, a variety of statistical approaches to, to help us decide from at, a, at an individual patient level, which treatment is preferable, non-operative versus operative, and then if it is operative, which treatment uh, is, is, is uh, ideal. Of course, we want to address the knowledge gaps with this sort of personalized approach, and this recent uh, guideline effort uh, led by Michael Failings of, uh, from Toronto help us to, helped us to identify where the knowledge gaps are. Of course, there are some areas where we probably don't need a personalized approach reliant on all this sophisticated data collection to understand uh, what the tr optimal treatment is. And this is one of them. Uh, so this is a 45 year old patient who's getting worse, not, uh, not able to use his hands, uh, can't work, can't walk without falling, very disabled, has multi-level cord compression. The evidence would say this patient needs surgery and that's really not uh, under debate. It's quite clear this patient underwent a two level fusion of their neck here and did quite well, was back to work after six weeks with improved symptoms. 
But there are areas where there are controversies, like so much of life and medicine, the controversies tend to exist on the margins, particularly at the, uh, uh, the um, ends of the spectrum, on the, in this case, the mild end of the spectrum. So this is a patient referred to me three, four years ago, who was a successful stock, stock bro broker and athlete who ha had an MRI scan. He's a bit of a hypochondriac because he had uh, just a little bit of neck pain, but some numbness in his thumb, but otherwise very functional. His quality of life was excellent um, and was a bit reticent to undergo surgery, but he does have impressive cord compression on his MRI scan. If we look at what the evidence shows about how we should treat this patient, there's not much. And this is what we discovered in, in our guideline approach that was performed this past uh, a year, there's not much to guide us. So what should we do? Should we watch and wait and not offer surgery? Of course, there's risks of that. With that, if the patient may deteriorate, uh, may develop more neurologic symptoms, and then we've missed our opportunity to intervene. Of course, the concerns with surgery are that uh, if we perform this uh, cervical fusion on, uh, on this uh, sort of patient, maybe this person would really have never deteriorated and we've performed an unnecessary surgery with attendant risks on somebody who didn't need it. And so there are a number of factors to consider here, uh, whether we operate or don't operate. But I think uh, the real crux of this problem is what's the natural history of this issue without surgery. And the existing literature, uh, which we reviewed recently, is very imprecise. There's no meaningful predictors of who's going to deteriorate and who won't deteriorate. And this leaves the clinician and surgeon in a bit of a precarious position. This is a key knowledge gap. And this is one area that we're trying to exploit and improve knowledge upon with our personalized approach. And we've developed and started this uh, DCM-NH study, natural history study. It's a five-year prospective longitudinal cohort study, which enrolls patients with mild symptoms, which are treated non-operatively to start. And the goal is to identify those, are at, those who are at high risk for deterior deterioration, such that they can be targeted early and selectively with surgery and those that are low risk can be followed non-operatively pre preventing unnecessary surgery. And there are a number of other sites involved. We've been fortunate to receive a number of uh, good grants for this with funding secured in the long term. Basically patients are enrolled they undergo a battery of tests um, and they're followed. And those who deteriorate get surgery, but those who don't uh, continue to be followed non-operatively up to five years. And the ultimate goal at the end of this is to develop individualized risk, uh, risk prediction tools or stratification uh, techniques that can be used by clinicians and surgeons um, to uh, inform treatment and counsel patients. We're hoping that this will improve care. Of course, this is a number of years away. Um, and in the interim, we've tried to do a number of exploratory analysis. This is uh, a, a paper done by one of our residents, Dr. Badawal, an excellent resident here. Um, and as part of his PhD, he's been looking at uh, this mild group of patients, and th these are a large group treated operatively. And he found that uh, amongst these mild uh, cervical myelopathy patients, those with increased preop neck pain, and motor symptoms, and female gender seem to have greater improvement in quality of life with operations, suggesting that this is a patient group that potentially should be targeted early uh, with surgery. So cervical myelopathy is um, really uh, uh, is associated with a large burden of suffering, but it's under-recognized uh, in the world and in the media and amongst the lay uh, public. And it's clear that a one-size-fits-all approach is not appropriate uh, for evaluating, counseling, or treating this patient group, and that it's necessary to apply a personalized medicine approach to really get improvement in advancements in care and outcomes. And we look forward to sharing the results of this um, uh, uh, multi-center study once available. I want to just segue and finish talking, uh, finish with talking about traumatic spinal cord injury. Um, and although the burden of suffering is somewhat less, um, the overall impact of traumatic spinal cord injury still looms large. There's about a million patients affected worldwide annually, um, sorry, worldwide uh, uh, in general. And uh, it's a very expensive condition to treat. Uh, with about $4 billion spent annually here in Canada, uh, treating for these, caring for these patients. We've seen recently that there's been a change in the phenotype of, sp of acute spinal cord injured patient. This is a provincial, uh, Ontario provincial data accumulated over the last 15 years. And what we've seen is that there's an increased incidence of uh, spinal cord injury due to uh, elderly patients who fall on a sustained cervical incomplete spinal cord injury and actually a decreased incidence amongst young patients who have injuries due to high energy trauma. So, phenotype of acute spinal cord injury is changing. We've certainly come a long way 
in the treatment of, uh, of this uh, patient group. Um, we've abdicated the very draconian approach of uh, putting a patient with acute spinal cord injury and fractures in uh, long-term uh, cervical traction while elements of the, the bony fracture healed. And we've moved towards being able to reconstitute the uh, structural integrity of the spine within hours after the injury and decompress the spinal cord. And um, some great work done here in Toronto led by, by Michael Failings has shown this to be effective um, and improve outcomes. But one area where we're really lagging and we've not caught up with the times is in our classification of uh, a traumatic spinal cord injury. We continue to rely on these very antiquated uh, uh, syndromic based classifications for spinal cord injury, complete versus incomplete. And amongst the incomplete group, we uh, have central cord syndrome, a number of other syndromes that I'm sure you heard about as medical students. But we've recently acknowledged and identified that these are really inadequate classification terms. They don't um, uh, really correlate with the pathophysiology of disease, and they fail to recognize the heterogeneity of pathology and recovery, and there's a need for a better classification system. So instead of using this older approach where we have a classification based on clinical features and pathoanatomy, uh, which we hope will predict outcome and allow for individualized care, we're moving in, the, in an opposite data-driven uh, direction where we use clinical course and uh, outcomes data to uh, engineer classification systems which can be used to uh, advocate for personalized uh, education outcomes and prognost uh, pro sorry, prognostication of, of outcomes. Of course, this again is a very data-hungry approach. We've been fortunate to create one of the world's largest prospective spinal cord injury registries We've been developing models, looking at complete and incomplete cervical spinal cord injury. We've been trying to adopt a number of uh, relatively novel analytic approaches, such as this approach. It's the group-based trajectory modeling approach, which gets its origins from actually developmental science and biological research. And it basically uses time-based data uh, to identify homogeneous trends and trajectories um, amongst this, uh, this data and um, basically improve classification. What we found, if you look at this very messy uh, hodgepodge of data, is that for spinal cord injury, patients recover neurologic uh, function over time at variable rates and variable degrees. And what this uh, analytic strategy allows us to do is to basically distill down this hodgepodge of data into a number of more unique trajectories of outcome. And in its um, more simpler format, this is work done by uh, one of our postdocs, uh, uh, Jaja Blessing, you're able to identify uh, homogeneous trajectories of recovery. And for patients with complete cervical spinal cord injury uh, who are basically treated in a very generic um, monolithic way before, we actually see that there are three uh, groups, some of which do not improve at all, but some of which actually do improve a substantial, substantial degrees and get some function back. And this is allowed for improved communication. This is a, a other great work done by Patan Badawala, one of our residents. Um, who has identified four unique trajectories of recovery for cervical incomplete patients uh, uh, after the, the initial traumatic event. And interestingly, each of these trajectories is, so, is associated with a number of unique uh, clinical variables, um, such that at the time of arrival uh, of the patient in the emergency department, the patient's uh, baseline characteristics can be used to predict um, the exact clinical trajectory and, uh, uh, and uh, outcome profile. And this can be used in a personalized way to help quantify expectations for recovery across the clinical care pathways. So um, this is a snapshot of what we're doing in traumatic spinal cord injury. Um, and it's an example of how big data in combination with novel analytics can be used to develop a personalized uh, prognostic uh, approach to care of these individuals. I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna close by thanking everybody involved with this uh, research, um, the wonderful trainees, my collaborators, uh, and, and importantly mentor, Michael Failings, who I'm deeply in, in, indebted to, um, in addition to my fantastic neurosurgery partners at St. Michael's and the great research staff, as well as sources of funding. Thank you again for the tremendous honor of this award and for the opportunity to speak and for your attention this morning. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Jeff. Um, wonderful presentation. And um, we'll get uh, Natalie set up here if you uh, stop sharing the screen. I just have a quick question as Natalie 
almost get set up. I'm going to introduce Natalie. So Natalie, I'm going to share slides uh, first for a second. Uh, but Jeff, a uh, question for you is uh, is related to um, you know the registry databases that are out there, and a lot of spine um, sort of practice has uh, depended recently on on an analysis, you know, using comparative effectiveness research uh, strategies, uh, which is kind of like taking big data and then trying to smooth it out to figure out what's the best approach, uh, you know, for a patient. Um, so, so are there attempts to compare what you're, you're driving at, which is artificial intelligence, machine learning of a variety of parameters, radiological biomarkers, as you mentioned, clinical presentation and registry data. Are they, um, in the end, which um, process do you think will be better? Yeah, I mean, I think um, a lot of what, I mean, we're all inundated with uh, discussions around AI and machine learning. And they're kind of championed as uh, really the panacea. We're going to discover so many great things by using these techniques, but really they're just analytic strategies. And um, really in some instances, not as good as traditional statistical approaches like regression based techniques. So at the end of the day, tried to cling to is that the quality of data still is the, is the, uh, the element uh, or factor that predicts success in the greatest fashion. So we've tried to ascribe to just collecting great quali good quality data in a in sound methodological fashion. And the analytic approach is less kind of important at the end of the day. Um, so I think by collecting good data and novel data, we'll get to the root of some of these issues which have plagued spine surgeons for years, hopefully. Great, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for your excellent uh, George Armstrong Peters uh, award-winning prize lecture today. And I'll remind you, Jeff, and, and the audience that the uh, Temerty gift to the Faculty of Medicine, which was a quarter of a billion, uh, $250 million included, a large amount going directly towards Artificial Intelligence Machine Learning Institute at the University of Toronto. So Jeff, I hope that you'll go visit the Dean and see what you can do to probably lose some uh, funding to support your efforts. Indeed, I will. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so. Next, we have uh, the Lister Prize introduction. So uh, Lister needs no introduction per se as a, as a luminary in surgery, but after his uh, name and in his honor, the award was set up at the University of Toronto dating back to 1980 that you can see here, the previous awardees. And uh, you can see the names of uh, several of these individuals. And uh, what you, you uh, can also appreciate is that sometimes the uh, George Armstrong Peters Prize uh, winners uh, convert to Lister Prize winners after many, many years, but not always. So, but here's the listing of uh, current uh, awardees for the Lister Prize. Let's talk a little bit about Natalie, who's this year's uh, award winner of the Lister Prize. Uh, bachelor's uh, from University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, uh, MD from uh, same institution, residency at Brown University. And, uh, you know, I was delighted um, to see, and I still am to this day, uh, Americans who do kind of a reverse migration and come to Canada versus the other directionality. So um, we may see more of that uh, pending the results of the American election. And Natalie and I were talking about that before everyone came online. In any event, uh, Natalie did come to Toronto to do her surgical oncology fellowship at the University of Toronto and became a staff uh, surgeon, general surgeon at Sunnybrook in 2006 and full professor after a very brief uh, time period in 2018. And she sits in the Sharif and Marie, uh, Mary uh, Lou Hanna Chair in Surgical Oncology. She has over 120 peer review publications and multiple peer review grants, most of them related to the CIHR over many, many years. So she's been extremely successful at getting a high level uh, peer reviewed uh, grant to support. I just listed here a few of her publications so you can see over the years what she's been interested in. Here's one on pancreatic uh, adenocarcinoma, here esophageal cancer and uh, esophageal gastric cancer. So she's a, a real expert in the realm of foregut uh, neoplasms and cancers uh, across all of uh, the world. And uh, not too long ago, she sent me a monograph, um, I believe where uh, she was um, lead author on numerous uh, publications on gastric cancer. So she's a, a world authority in that particular area. And uh, showing here a photograph of the family from 2017, Natalie, uh, holding one of her children. She has three children and her husband, uh, Taylor, and uh, family members, grandparents uh, visiting 
Yellowstone National Park. Uh, so again, uh, just delighted that Americans bank their careers in, in Canada professionally. And so Natalie, you've been uh, extremely successful and we very much look forward to your um, award-winning Lister Prize presentation on patient reported outcomes and patient-centric research. So I'll stop sharing and turn it over to you, Natalie. Okay, let's see if we can get this up. I'm feeling pretty good about um, the decision to move to Canada these days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, anyhow, I digress. Um, so thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, thank you for um, the support that I've received from the university and from the Department of Surgery over the years. Um, and uh, and uh, I'd really like to um, thank the team that recruited me up here to stay at the University of Toronto. Um, as you said, I, um, I have an amazing support team. I have an amazingly supportive family. Um, I have a great group of partners um, and I have a fantastic group of residents and um, students and uh, research assistants that I work with who support all the research that I've done. And I'd like to highlight um, the work that we've done over the past many years, um, but really give a shout out to the teams that I work with and support me every day. Um, so one of the uh, reasons that I stayed in Toronto was the opportunity to work at ICES. Um, I, obviously, University of Toronto is a phenomenal place, um, and I have fantastic partners at Sunnybrook, um, but the academic opportunities certainly were one of the draws to stay in Toronto, um, which I suppose makes me a little bit of a data geek, but I think Dr. Wilson just admitted he also was a bit of a data geek as well, so I think I'm in good company here. Uh, so for those of you who don't know about ICES, this is a provincial data set and it brings in data across the province in terms of hospitalization, in terms of treatments that the patients have had, um, their cancer pathology, what the physicians have billed and how much this all costs to the system, um, as well as recently patient reported outcomes. And so when I thought about how to um, make this talk, um, there's a lot of things we could have talked about. I could have talked about um, disparities of getting into the healthcare system and some of the work this team has done looking at um, what patients come into the system and how they're treated and the barriers that patients even in Canada and even in Ontario have getting appropriate treatment. Um, we could have looked at outcomes from surgery or chemotherapy uh, in for cancer patients, or we could have looked at the cost that it, uh, we accrue to the system when we provide these therapies. Um, but what I wanted to focus on today was patient reported outcomes, because I think that's a, a novel research technique. And I think it's something that's going to become more and more important to all of us um, as we move through personalized medicine. So today we're going to talk about patient reported outcomes, um, the impact of patient reported outcomes or pros on clinical care and on the outcomes patients receive. And then very importantly, I'm going to talk about creating patient centric research and how our team has evolved over the past 15 years to include patients more and more and why this is very important. Um, as a disclosure, I am clinical lead for patient reported outcomes for and symptom management for Cancer Care Ontario, now part of Ontario Health. Um, and very importantly, uh, very generously supported by the Sharif and Mary Lou Hanna Chair in Surgical Oncology. Uh, and Dr. Hanna really deserves a lot of credit for this research because it's his vision that has allowed this to happen. So, so how do proms work or how do pros work? And I think the best way to describe this is to think about what happens when someone says, how are you doing? So if you went to your family practice office this week and uh, your family practice doctor said, how are you doing? You would probably say something like, I'm fine. It's okay. A little bit busy. Eh, could be a little less stressed. Um, but that doesn't really relay what's going on in your life. And so if your family doctor said, how are you doing on a scale of one to nine, can you rate your anxiety? On a scale of one to nine, how are you doing in terms of sleep? on a scale of one to nine, how's your stress level? You would probably give a very different answer. And your score may have changed from Tuesday to Friday and your score may change next week. Um, and as we go through the remainder of the fall, all of our scores may change going into winter. So having this information and categorizing it allows providers to know more about what's going on with their patients um, and follow it by time. 
And we see that in the cancer population. This is data from the Cleveland Clinic. Um, this is um, what patients volunteered is the yellow. So when the provider walked in and said, how are you doing? The yellow is what the patients volunteered. I'm having pain. The blue is what you find out if you say on a scale of one to 10, how is your nausea? Score it. On a scale of one to 10, how is your pain? Do you have any depressive symptoms? Um, so you can find much more about your patients if you ask them to do a checklist and put them on a Likert scale and ask them to score what their symptoms are. This becomes critically important, and we know this from a randomized controlled trial um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, because we can improve patient outcomes this way. So the STAR is basically their version of ESAS, which is generalized symptom assessment screening, pain, nausea, um, depression. And based on chart review, they found that patients who had the STAR or the special um, symptom assessment had fewer symptoms over time. Over time, these patients came to the emergency department less often. This becomes very important when we're build, building a sustainable healthcare system. And more importantly, these patients survived longer. These are metastatic cancer patients. They survived longer if you ask them, how are you doing? Please score it. And the way this happened is because when it was scored and when the, the team detected a high score, they intervened. So if you had a high nausea score, they changed your medication. If you had a high tiredness score, maybe they dropped your chemotherapy dose. Maybe they gave you a bolus of IV fluids, but this allowed patients to stay on chemotherapy longer and they survived better. So really important for us to learn how to utilize these tools effectively. And so this is where the work with Cancer Care Ontario comes in. Uh, in the early 2000s, it was re well recognized that as a cancer care system, we did not do a good job managing and um, assessing patient symptoms. And so the palliative care program was actually only established in 2005 for Cancer Care Ontario. Uh, ESAS as a screening mechanism was um, started in 2007 and really ramped up um, in 2010 and 2011. Um, the psychosocial oncology program came into place later, um, and now we're doing more specialized screening so that we can get an idea of what's going on with our patients and how we can support them best. So as it stands now, or really as it stood before COVID, a patient comes into the cancer center, uh, goes to a kiosk and fills this out. Now we're moving everything online as with much else in the world, and they assess How's their pain? How's their nausea, depression, anxiety, well-being? And they score it from zero to 10. And this information is given to the, the clinical care team. Um, we are expanding into more specific uh, pros for sp specific patients. For prostate cancer, for example, uh, tiredness and shortness of breath is not really that useful, but a discussion of sexual dysfunction and urinary incontinence is much more important and impactful for that patient population. Head and neck cancer patients um, have significant burden, and we do need to know more about depressive and anxiety symptoms because ESAS is just a screen and not a validated tool. Um, so we're moving into more specific screening. Now, building upon what Cancer Care Ontario did, the Ministry of Health recognized that there's other areas that we could use this as well. And I think this touches on some of the things Dr. Wilson was discussing is PROMS for specific disease sites. And so they've moved into PROMS for orthopedics. Um, so they're doing the Oxford hip and knee scale and generalized questionnaire. And this is for patients who are being assessed. In the pre-surgical assessment period, they then have their hip and knee replacement surgery. And then this is remeasured in the early postoperative period and in the late postoperative period. And this is going to allow us to understand what's the impact of the surgeries that we're doing? Uh, how can we support patients better? And are there certain groups that do particularly well or particularly not well with our therapies? And we need to focus on those groups. Um, going along with all of this, there are management guides for clinicians and patients for all of these symptoms, because there's no point in identifying these symptoms if we don't do something about it. So that brings us to the research. Um, so as I said, I was working at ICES and um, the, realized that there was this wealth of information that Cancer Care Ontario had collected on cancer patients. Uh, currently, we stand at about 4 million ESAS scores from 2010 to um, 2020. Um, so a tremendous amount of data that we can then combine with treatment and understand what's going on with patients as they go through our system. Um, and a lot of what I'm going to present, you're going to say, well, that's pretty obvious, Natalie. Cancer patients have symptoms, um, but if we don't measure it, we're not going to be able to understand it and we're not going to be able to improve upon it. 
And so this is work uh, that Dr. Buvis and uh, Laura Davis performed. He was one of our SSTP students. Um, and they looked at patients as they come into the cancer system. So this is the first year after cancer diagnosis. We excluded anyone who died in the first year. Oops. And we looked at uh, 120,000 patients with 729,000 ESAS scores. Um, and this is the worst symptom, it's actually tiredness. So you can see over here, this is a percentage of patients who have a score greater than four over time. Tiredness is the worst problem. Next is well being. And then things that you classically think about for cancer patients, such as nausea or pain here in the middle of the pack with green, these are not the symptoms that patients report as being most bothersome. The other thing you can see is that over time, the symptoms decrease and they decrease pretty quickly. So if, if we think about things that we could put into place to support patients better, a rapid diagnostic unit so that we can shorten the interval between entering the cancer system and when the patient receives the treatment may decrease things like anxiety, which is really quite bad as patients come into the cancer system, but gets better as they get their treatment and have uh, op their, um, their tumors treated. Uh, we know that cancer symptoms vary by stage. This is uh, work that Dr. Hapera has performed for lung cancer that was recently published. And you can see as stage increases, the burden of symptoms on patients increases. Uh, and then we look at what happens um, by disease site and all cancers do not follow the same trajectory. And so the next thing we chose to focus on is the obvious outlier here, which is oral cavity and uh, head and neck cancers. And this is work that Cal, um, Catherine Allen Adebayo uh, performed looking at why there's this spike. And well, the, the spike is because the patients are undergoing treatment, but we can very easily define when radiation started, when chemotherapy started and when radiation ended and follow the symptoms of the patients. Um, so we combined our efforts um, with one of the new recruits to the otolaryngology department, which is Tony Eskender, uh, who was independently looking at ER admissions uh, in his uh, research. And he was finding that 28 to 55% of patients in Ontario have an ER visit or a hospitalization during the time of their therapy. Um, but probably some of these could be avoided because only one in four ER visits uh, required an admission. And so he and I began to work with another SSTP student, uh, who's Chris Noel in otolaryngology, um, and see if there is an impact on uh, ESAS for hospital hospitalization. And of course there is. Um, so there's a straight linear relationship as your ESAS score increases, the chances that you're gonna show up in the emergency department or the hospital in the next 14 days increases. Uh, and there's a lot of things going on with these patients uh, in terms of treatment modality and site of cancer and burden of cancer. But the number one important factor in terms of the patients coming to the emergency department um, or requiring a hospitalization is their ESAS score. And so this brings us back to what we're doing with Cancer Care Ontario. This is cancer center related, and they asked me to um, hide the can exact cancer centers, but you can see across the province, the level of anxiety, the level of depression, um, the level of pain varies by uh, cancer center uh, for reasons that we don't quite fully understand. But what we do understand is that the level of support also varies by cancer center. And different cancer centers select where they place recruitments for physiotherapists versus um, occupational therapists versus speech therapists. And I can tell you that the, some of this work has become quite impactful at the local level uh, because following one of these presentations, one of these hospitals then approached their leadership and said, look, we're really not doing very well for our head and neck cancer patients. We need to hire a new speech therapist. And by taking this data back to the leadership, the leadership agreed they need another speech therapist and someone was hired. Um, so, other things that we've looked at are depression. Uh, Dr. Halle has looked at the incidence of depression across cancer patients, uh, and a positive depression screen is actually two or greater out of 10. And then we looked within ICES to find any evidence of interventions. And so we looked for palliative care assessment, whether the patients were referred on to psychiatry or psychology, um, did a social work a referral occur, or did the patient receive antidepressant therapy? Um, 
unfortunately, what we found um, is the answer is often no here. Um, most patients did not get a psychiatry assessment, uh, antidepressants, um, some got palliative care assessments, um, but, but the level of support that we provided to our cancer patients was really quite low. Um, there's a lot of stigma associated with treating depression and especially within the cancer population, in some situations, it's almost expected that one might have depression after a cancer diagnosis. Um, so why treat it? But there's actually very good data that treating this is really quite important. Um, critically, if you treated this, patients did improve on their next ESAS score. Um, so again, underlining that the importance of screening for this and then intervening. This is Cancer Care Ontario data looking at support that patients received in this arena. So this is the percentage of patients with anxiety or depression. Um, these dots are cancer centers. This is head and neck cancer patients above and lung cancer patients below. And you can see, even though we have universal health care, support is different. Um, these are de-identified, but this is the same cancer center. So whether you have head and neck cancer or lung cancer, about 50% of the time you receive a uh, social work assessment in this cancer center. Um, this cancer center not doing so well, 17% or 19%. Um, this cancer center is very different. 100% of head and neck cancer patients versus 19% of lung cancer patients were supported by social workers during their journey. Um, so you can see that the way that we build the system and make decisions regarding allocation does impact what's happening for our patients. Um, this is an analysis um, that Stephanie Tung performed. She's, uh, was just a, um, she was a clinical resident, not going through the SSTP, so uh, highlighting the ability of our team members to do research during their clinical years and not doing SSTP. Uh, this is published in BMJ, looking at pain and pancreas cancer patients. Again, something we would um, suspect happens, um, but, but we found that many patients had a moderate to high pain score. Um, one in four did not receive opioids. Um, only 14% received radiation and only 1% had a nerve block. So a lot of opportunity to do better for our patients. And finally, uh, Dr. Bubis and uh, Laura Davis went back and looked at symptoms at the end of life. And so they looked at the patients who died during uh, our study period um, and found that unfortunately over half struggled with severe scores. So a score of seven to 10. Patients who are more likely to have severe scores were um, female, elderly, high comorbidity, low socioeconomic status. Um, coincidentally, these are the patients who are less likely to actually even do an ESAS score. So they, these patients may be suffering even more than what we detect. What we see is that as you get closer to death, with death being over here at the right-hand side, there's an inflection point that happens about three months before death. The beginning of the cohort, symptoms are fairly well controlled. We have an inflection point around three months prior to death. Um, really critically important is the number of patients assessed. You have to walk into a cancer center to get an ESAS score. So we have 5,748 um, 5, patients walking into a cancer center with severe symptoms in the 14 days prior to death, which is almost the same number that walked in three, four months prior to death. So even without the COVID pandemic, you can imagine that we could do a much better job supporting these patients out of the cancer center than in the cancer center. Um, we took a little bit of a deeper look at pancreas cancer patients. Um, this is uh, work that Dr. Hamid performed for us. And you can find that we know exactly when this inflection happens for pancreas cancer patients. It happens when they, around the time they get the last chemotherapy. And what happens right now is you stop the chemotherapy because of progression. You probably tell the patient, I'll see you in three to four weeks. We'll get a CAT scan or blood work in three or four weeks. And that's probably not what we should do probably at this point because we know what's gonna happen next, we should be getting palliative care to go ahead and assess and see the patient so that we can have the supports in place for what we know is gonna happen next. And finally, and most importantly, I'm gonna talk about patient engagement and, and really how our group has changed and evolved over the past um, several years. Um, so the CIHR has an, an initiative for patient engagement and they, they have these lofty goals to improve health and improve healthcare and improve cost effectiveness. Um, and I think it does all of these things, but I think it also improves research. And so this is um, the team at My Gut Feeling. This is Katie and this is uh, Teresa here. And um, they both had total gastrectomies and they started a support group for patients, but we've engaged with them um, and they're supporting us now because they're helping our research initiatives. 
Um, and so what I think um, has happened in terms of evolution of how I have viewed patient engagement is this. Um, so at the beginning of my career, I would do research and I would take it to the patients and I would say, here, here's the research we have done. Don't you like it? Um, and, and they would say, yes, that's nice. Thank you for doing that for us. Um, and then later on we said, well, maybe we should involve them a little bit more. Uh, and so we would take it to them when we had all the data complete uh, and we would say, here's a paper we're writing. Do you want to help us write it and help us um, make some key phrases in it? Kind of like adding icing to the cake. Uh, it's a little bit of decorative, but not really that meaningful. And so as we evolved, we started taking steps back into the research and, and began to ask, what actually do you want us to measure? Um, do you want us to measure survival? Um, or do you want us to measure the number of times your daughter has to take off work to bring you to radiation? Um, do you want to measure how much it costs to you and your family in, in terms of uh, parking charges? Um, do you want us to measure what your symptoms were following your Whipple surgery? Um, and so that's how we began to evolve. And, and really, this is where we are now. Um, they're on our grant team. And so as we begin to think of a project um, and to think of how we're going to lay out the project over the next five to 10 years, and we have them involved here, where it doesn't even begin to look like a cake. Um, and it's really quite messy sometimes, um, but they've been involved in the beginning of many of our projects, uh, talking about how to outline the projects and how to involve other patients um, so that we can create something that's really meaningful for them um, as well as for the healthcare system. And so on that, I will end um, just with a big thanks to uh, all my teams, uh, our grant funders and our patient partners. So, thank you. Great, thanks, uh, Natalie. Excellent uh, presentation and a uh, clearly very much uh, needed and important uh, field in, in uh, cancer and uh, survivorship. And uh, I had a question for you. It relates to um, essentially the politics at the different uh, cancer centers. What determines uh, whether there's allocation towards social work or you know, psychiatry to assess patients and, and to try to help them on their journey uh, and what influence does that have on, on the, the, the patient reported outcomes that you discussed? Um, I, I think that's a critically important question. I think it's something that we don't, um, we don't fully understand because um, up until the past few years, they had collected the patient reported outcomes, but not really uh, assessed them center to center. And there, there is variation center to center. Um, I can see variation across centers and I, I know enough by working with the centers, uh, which center, you know, there one center has really good scores for lung cancer patients, but I know that their radiation therapy department has undertaken a quality of improvement project uh, and has a dyspnea clinic to help lung cancer patients. Uh, and I think what happens is it comes a, as a grassroots effort um, and different clinicians take the lead or different nurses uh, or social workers take the lead at different cancer centers. And, you know, everyone has their favorite disease site. Um, and so, you know, if you have a very strong leadership team for lung cancer at your center, you're probably going to see more engagement with that team. Um, and you're gonna see more engagement with the, the staff working with that team. Um, so it, it's, it's very grassroots um, and you can see things have grown up differently at the different cancer centers. But when you provide data like this and give it back to the cancer centers, then you can say, you know, look, at your center, 50% of patients are complaining of um, depression, whereas a different one, it's maybe 20%. Um, so let's look at, maybe your patients are different. Maybe they have higher burden. Um, maybe there's socioeconomic differences, but maybe maybe you've struggled to have the psychosocial oncology team that you need. So let's work on how to build that. That's great. And then uh, last question, uh, how were you able to look at, or are you looking at op opioid addiction and the PROs uh, and what does that tell you? That's, um, I, I think that's a critical thing that we need to look at uh, and very complex. You can see in the data, the time trend and Lisa Barbera had looked at this um, when she was in this role before I was, um, the increase in opioid prescriptions, um, you do have to balance that. But I think uh, Dr. Tung's work shows there are adjuncts to pain management that we don't use. Um, we don't use radiation enough. We don't use nerve blocks enough. 
uh, and if we tried to use those some more, we may be able to decrease our opioid use actually. Okay, great. Thanks, Natalie. If you could stop sharing your screen for a sec, I'll, I'll come back on and I just wanna make a final concluding announcement. Great, thanks. Uh, so two wonderful uh, presentations today. Thanks to Jeff, thanks to Natalie. I think you can all see that uh, research is alive and well in the Department of Surgery. I'll, I'll make a boast once again. And for the second year in a row, the Department of Surgery has ranked in the top five in the world in the US News and World Report for Departments of Surgery. And you can see why based on Jeff's and Natalie's uh, presentation today. Uh, Natalie just gave the Lister Award presentation. I want to encourage all of you to attend the Kurgan Lectureship, which will be in February, uh, because as Natalie just gave the Lister Award, this um, book is all about uh, Lister's uh, history of the development of, um, of the technique of antisepsis written by Lindsay Fitzharris, who will be our, our Kurgan lecturer this year. And we will have a book signing and a book handout opportunity for all of you. So uh, tying in with the theme of the Lister Award presentation today, please stay tuned for the Kurgan Lectureship. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you for attending today. Uh, special thanks to Jeff and Natalie for their outstanding uh, presentations. Everybody have a great day and a great weekend. Thanks for joining.